Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ian Little, and thank you very much for joining me for one of EWT's Wild Chats. So, I'm going to speak to you today around the future of South Africa and what our country could look like in 2100 and the decisions that need to be made in getting yes, us into the future. I am the senior manager for habitats at the Endangered Wildlife Trust. Have three core focal areas, saving species, saving habitats and benefiting people. Of course, all of these three speak to each other and they work in synergy. Um, from my perspective, saving habitats is the absolute core of all of these, and it is the, the most critical factor in conservation today. I oversee four programs at the EWT, the Drylands Conservation Program, the Sotpansberg Protected Area, Threatened Amphibians, and recently I've taken on the Birds of Prey Program as well. I, I'm also the Regional Chair for the Commission on Ecosystem Management for Eastern Southern Africa. So that's me. Um, we're going to turn off my video now um, so that you can focus on the slides and not have to stare at me throughout this, this presentation. So let's kick in. Glo the globally, this is a recent paper that came out in, in June, um, on the 5th of June, so very recent. And this is a, a, an assessment of the 50% of the planet that is still intact. And the authors of this paper suggest that this is a reason for some optimism. Um, but I'm a little bit skeptical of that. If you look at the green areas where they are arguing that it is intact, the vast majority of those areas are either desert, tundra, or mountain. In other words, humans wouldn't have been able to destroy them if they tried. So I'm very skeptical of their conclusion. The, the map itself, however, is very interesting and, and very concerning. Here's another paper that came out this year. Um, this one looks at food production and how the planet is going to look in terms of sustaining all the people on it. And they worked out, I'm sure it was through a, a whole lot of very complicated algorithms, that in theory, 10.2 billion people can be fed without compromising what they call the Earth system. Um, so what they're saying is all of the areas that have green here on this, on this global map could potentially produce more food. Um, and while that might be true, I question how you're going to achieve that without causing extensive habitat damage. Um, they don't go into those details. But I think one of the most important things that I, I found out of this paper was the little caption on the right here, up to 30% of all food produced is lost to waste. And I think that is something that we should really focus on. If we can reduce that, we can really sustain people much better on this planet and its finite resources. So we all know about the massive plastic issues, deforestation, palm oil, the massive fires in the Amazon, coronavirus, all of these big things that have hit the media and have made people all of a sudden realize that we rely on this planet to survive. This has been a decade of big awakening for the human race. And unfortunately, I don't think we've woken up enough. And I'm gonna try and illustrate why I think that and what we need to do in South Africa to realize what's going on. We obviously don't have the ability to have global impact in terms of our conservation efforts um, directly anyway. And so I'm gonna be focusing on South Africa and what we can directly do to influence our landscape and the future of what South Africa is going to look like. This is one last global picture. This is from the Society for Conservation Biology and looks at a comparison between areas that have been converted as opposed to protected. And again, very scary. The, the white areas are those that aren't protected or converted. And again, those are deserts and tundra. A very small proportion are blue. Those are the protected areas. And quite a few of those are in deep forest or in desert as well, or, or, or large mountain systems and the vast majority has already been converted. Very, very scary image this. So let's focus on Mzansi. We're obviously all proud to live here, but we're gonna need to live here for a long time. And our, our children, our grandchildren, our grandchildren's children are gonna need to live here. So 
we need to make sure that we've got something that we can be proud of in 100, 200 years time, not in the five years or you know, the five year cycles that government and, and politicians think of. So here's a little experiment that a colleague of ours at the Department of Environmental Affairs played with, Peter Lukey. And what he looked at is a theoretical landscape of what South Africa looks at now on the left here. Then looking forward, what it could look like in terms of business as usual. It, it's a scattered, very chaotic mix of the different land uses and what it could potentially look like if we think carefully, if we collaborate and we develop sustainably. So the sustainable development picture at the bottom there is what we're aiming at. What we want to have is consolidated, large functional protected areas, large high productivity agricultural areas. And we don't want to prevent development. We want to enhance development, but do it cleverly in the right places and the right way. So that's what we're going to get through in this talk today. So South Africa is very advanced actually on a global stage in terms of our legislation and how we do things and all of the paperwork behind what informs our decisions. So we've got things like these national spatial development frameworks. This was developed by the Department of Rural, Rural Development and Land Reform and Planning and Monitoring and Evaluation. And note here that the Department of Environmental Affairs wasn't included and that the Department of Mineral Resources wasn't included. And I'll come back to that. So if we look at one of, a few of the images that, that were developed, um, we look at the ecological infrastructure and protected areas and the critical biodiversity areas and strategic water source areas. And they, they really outline what, what good areas we have and what, what really, really important areas we have that we should be focusing on. So really thumbs up, good start. You'll see I've put little emojis to, to outline my impression of, of what's going on. Then if we look at the national resource production areas, now we're looking at agriculture and, and those sorts of things. And the picture still looks pretty decent. We're starting to overlay now how we start utilizing the landscape and it, it's still pretty good. But now we introduce competing agendas and we look at, here yeah, they've, they've put an illustration of spatial development priorities in terms of urban nodes. And that's a pretty scary picture. Now, when we overlay that onto the other, the other pretty pictures, it doesn't look so pretty anymore. And then we move on to this, which is the spatial development pattern and includes all the roads and rails and all the other linear infrastructures and things start to get very chaotic. And then these are what they call their action areas. Um, nothing too surprising. Most of the areas are just expanded versions of, of what we saw before, expanding on the urban areas and expanding on the, the, the movement corridors. Um, and interestingly, they've included national transformation corridors, and we're not entirely sure what the plan is there, but we're, we're working towards trying to figure, out, figure that out and work with them. But as you can see, as soon as you bring in all the other competing agendas, the landscape becomes very complicated. And unfortunately, the reality is that for each piece of land, there is almost always not enough communication between all the different competing agendas in terms of deciding what is going to happen with that land. And as I said before, note that mining did not even feature, it didn't feature strongly, it hardly featured at all in this National Spatial Development Framework. Here is a picture of all of the mineral deposits in South Africa overlaid with our river systems. Now bear in mind that South Africa is one of the 30 most arid countries on the planet. And our rivers are critically important for our survival as, as people in this country. And then if we look at those divided up into the different types of, of mining and whether they're active or not and overlaid onto the vegetation types or, and, and the threat status of those vegetation types. It's quite scary what, what the prospect is in terms of the impact of mining on, on our natural systems and our water resources. So let's leave mining behind now and let's focus more on the most important thing in a very arid country, which is water. So not so long ago, uh, a layer was developed which describes our strategic water source areas. Now, what this is effectively is it's the 8% of land surface in South Africa that produces 
50% or more of the water that we rely on to survive. So these are the areas, you'll see where the arrows are, are, are pointing on this map. Those areas supply the water for the big urban areas and the vast majority of the population. So Kauteng gets about 65% of its water from these areas, Bloemfontein 70%. In Cape Town and Etiquini, 98%. So, so these are, are critical areas. They're really, really important. And bearing in mind here that the, all the predictions say that South Africa is going to get hotter and drier. So if we don't take care of these areas, we're in big trouble. And then we need to consider alien invasive plants. Um, we all know what they are. We all know kind of what they do, but I don't think any normal person on the street realizes the density and quite the, 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 the quantity of alien invasive plants out there in our catchments. And these have a massive impact on, on the water yields. Um, we've got big programs like the EPWP programs that are tackling these, but they're just not doing the job. They're just not getting there. So we've got to, we've got to really rethink this whole strategy in terms of addressing these alien invasive plants. And then we get a curveball every now and then. So some very clever people in, in the IUCN decided that we should start planting more trees around the globe. And some people within South Africa's government signed on to the bond challenge. And the bond challenge is all about planting trees. Now for a country that doesn't naturally have that many trees, this is a cataclysmic decision. We basically agreed to plant over a million hectares of trees when we should actually only have around 220,000 hectares of natural forest. So what we've effectively agreed to is planting pine trees over the whole of the Drakensberg, which is just ludicrous. So these sorts of decisions really need more careful thought before they go ahead. And then amongst all of these competing agendas, how do we figure out what our priorities are? And I've highlighted our here because our means us as conservationists. We do this by looking at where are all the threatened species and we've got amazing data. We really do have incredible data compared to the rest of Africa and, and really compared to most of the world in terms of where species are and where our threatened species are, even, even for a mega diverse country. Um, for those that don't know, we're arguably in the top three most diverse countries in the world. So that's the most species diversity. And for the, if you look at it in the most conservative way, we, we, we're absolutely in the top 10, but potentially in the top three. That, that's quite phenomenal. We look at where we don't have sufficient data for a specific species. Some, some species are very difficult to, to monitor. Something like this yellow-breasted pipit, then we, we use species distribution modeling. So on the right here, you can see the, the little dots are where we do know they occur and we use complicated distribution models to figure out where they are likely to occur. So we, we can still get a good sense of what the distributions are. And even down to the very small species like these colophon beetles. Um, these colophon beetles are pretty amazing things that occur on the tops of all the mountains in the Western Cape. Pretty much every peak has a different species on it. And most of these are vulnerable, endangered or critically endangered. So they're in big trouble. And with climate change, most things are predicted to try and move up mountains because they, they've tried to find cooler climatic belts. These guys are already on the top. So the pre prediction for them with climate change is pretty dire. Um, so we, we've still got to try and figure out what we can do for them. But the point is that all of these things need to be taken into account when we think about how we prioritize where we focus our conservation work. Then we've got these complex conservation planning maps that take a lot of these data into account and put them all together to create things like red lists for ecosystems. On the left here is an indication of South Africa's red list for ecosystems from the most threatened in red to the vulnerable in, in yellow and the least concern in green. And then scarily, if we overlay here on the right, the, the white parts are the parts that have already been transformed. So these are already mines or, or farms or they're no longer natural habitat. And the picture is vastly different. There's not much left at all. And then we look at the more proactive and um, positive outcomes and things like the National Protected Area Expansion Strategy. So 
the, the dark blue is the existing protected areas and the, the green areas on this map are the areas that have been identified as most important for new protected area proclamations. So these kind of graphics really give us good guidance in terms of where we should be focusing our, our new protected area work. Then if we look at what we've done as an organization, we've taken all of these things and we've taken our priorities as an organization and we've mapped them into the 10 geographic zones that are the priorities for us. And these obviously include the strategic water source areas. They take into account the key biodiversity areas, critical biodiversity areas, protected area expansion, strategic water source areas, and all the species as well. And this is now a map that indicates where we as an organization are going to focus our landscape scale work. This doesn't mean that we won't do conservation work on species outside of these areas. It just means that we're going to consolidate our efforts and resources in these areas. So how do we influence what South Africa looks like in 2100? One of the really, really useful tools that we have is um, biodiversity stewardship. Um, and biodiversity stewardship is a means of protected area expansion for private properties. Though these, these properties remain in the hands of private landowners, but they are proclaimed as protected areas under various different types of agreements, whether it's nature reserves at the top or protected environments or going down through the other, the other categories. Now, the properties have to qualify for these and we work with this process extensively to get landowners to proclaim their land as conservation areas. They can proclaim just sections of their properties or their entire property. This is slightly outdated. I haven't had a chance to update it, but this is an indication of where we are currently working on stewardship work. So new proclamations of protected areas. It's a bit scattergun, but it follows very strong themes um, linked to our programs. And we are obviously working constantly to try and expand on this. The only thing limiting our ability to expand protected areas is the funding that we receive to do so. Um, so we work very closely with landowners all over the country to try and expand these areas. Each one of these red dots is a vast piece of landscape. So with any luck, and, and, and note that, a, that they follow a, a curve along the Eastern Escarpment, which follows the, the strategic water source area. And this is, this is what we've done to date. Um, we formally proclaimed over 5,000 hectares of nature reserves and over 100,000 hectares of protected environments. And we are currently in process with another 44,000 hectares of nature reserve and another just under 100,000 hectares of protected environment. So we're, we're getting there, but this is only scraping the surface in terms of what we need to do in order for South Africa to be in a good state in 100 years time. And this is all great, but we need to keep an eye on the other development agendas. We don't want to stop them. We want to work with them to make sure that they're done properly. And in order to do this, we kickstarted a project in 2018, um, which really works around the environmental impact assessment systems, trying to improve those processes and to improve the information systems behind them. The Department of Environmental Affairs at that stage was just initiating a tool called the Environmental Screening Tool. And that tool will allow development or developers to have a quick snapshot before even going into an EIA process of what potential environmental impacts there could be on an area that they are proposing to work on. So it is now mandatory for all environmental assessment practitioners to include a screening tool report in their EIA. So in effect, it means that they cannot miss out on a threatened species. So the, 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 the core of the, the screening tool that the core of our approach to the screening tool is contributing the species distribution models for all of the threatened and endemic animals. So that's all the vertebrates. So what we are doing is we are doing a detailed predictive model for each of the threatened and endemic species and building those into a national layer that goes into the screening tool. So if a developer clicks on a, on a property that they are looking to develop, it will instantly tell them whether one of those threatened species is predicted to be there and that they, they can't overlook it anymore. That's the plan anyway. So 
these are the different taxonomic groups that we're working with and we've subsequently included a couple of the invertebrates, butterflies and dragonflies. In January, we launched the first 151 species. Um, these have all been modeled and their layers are now in the screening tool. So none of these species will be missed in future development applications. Um, our, our team, Dominic and Oliver, are working very hard to get the rest sorted out and, and included in that. So as I said, they get integrated into the screening tool and these little blobs all get combined to give us guidance so that none of these threatened or endemic species are overlooked. And of course, what goes with this is a whole lot of field work to go and fill in the gaps and the data gaps. And this is the really good stuff. I haven't managed to get out on one yet. Oliver gets to do all the fun stuff, but I'm definitely going to make a plan to get out there. So onto the more tedious side of it, but also critically important is the actual legislation and, and the process behind it. So, there's been a lot of progress over the last five years. All of these different government documents are improvements in the EIA process and associated legislative processes. And we're working closely with these to provide guidance on how they're interpreted and how they're used. So the EIA process is quite a complicated thing. I'm not going to get into it. But one of the most important things here is the first mention of not approving the actual development application is right at the end, which is ludicrous to have the, the, the developer pay all of this money through this whole process and only at the end decide if, it's, if it should happen or not is just a perverse incentive. And the fact that the, the assessment practitioner is paid by the developer is equally perverse. So there, there are a lot of challenges here. Most environmental assessment practitioners are incredibly ethical and trying to do the right thing, but the system doesn't support it. So some of the things that we're busy with at the moment around this is we're looking at cumulative impacts. A lot of, well, almost all environmental impact assessments look at the piece of land, the footprint of the development, and they don't take into account what's happening in all of the properties all around that, that footprint. And so what we're trying to do is make it easily accessible in a mapped process for assessment practitioners and what we call interested and affected parties. That's everyone else that has a vested interest in whether that development goes ahead or not to assess whether there are multiple other developments in the area that this will be adding on to, as opposed to just a small footprint. And this map that you see here is, is a map of the renewable development applications in South Africa. And this is available on the DEA website. Yeah, DEF, and environmental affairs, basically. This is a, a different one. This is a, a map developed by, by Oxpeca. Um, it's called the Mine Alert map. You can also access this at, at any stage. Um, if you go from top left, that's a national picture of all the mining applications and mining licenses. To the right is zoomed in a bit, and then bottom right is zoomed in even more. And you can see that within a 30 kilometer area there, there are a large number of mines. I mean, this is one of the slightly more dense areas in the country, but the number of mining applications in South Africa is just amazing. It, it, it's it, it's mind-boggling. It's scary. Um, these are what the, the pictures on the bottom left here are what these landscapes look like. The fact that South Africa is still as reliant on coal-powered systems is just ludicrous. Mitigation hierarchy. Now, this is one of the key fundamental underlying processes that should govern EIA thought processes. It should start by trying to avoid, followed by minimizing, followed by rectifying, followed by reducing, the rectifying and reducing is mitigating, and then only last offsetting. Now, this is all very complicated, but the point is that this is a, a process that was outlined as an international guideline and it's not being followed adequately. It, not just in South Africa, in most countries. So what we're doing is we are, we've developed a partnership with BirdLife South Africa and we are developing a guideline to guide this process and to inform environmental assessment practitioners of how best to use this process in conjunction with the EIA process to make sure that decision making is done in a responsible way. 
And this will be done in conjunction with an offsets guideline that is being developed by the South African National Biodiversity Institute. We've also developed these toolkits, which will be used to train communities on the ground. 99% of the time, developers go into rural areas and in the process of putting in a development application, it is, it, they are obligated to go through a public participation process, which means they need to let everyone that is an interested and affected party, anyone that has a vested interest in whether the development happens or not, including local communities, know about what the impact is going to be and how they are going to mitigate that impact. 99% of the time, the community doesn't know what their environmental rights are and they are not empowered to make their own decisions around whether they should support this or not. And invariably, the communities decide to support the development in seeking the jobs that are promised for the next 10 years, not realizing that the area is going to be impacted for the next 200 years and their water supply is going to be contaminated and 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 and. So this really gives local communities a much better stance in terms of their ability to make decisions around whether they support these developments or not. If we look at EIAs in general, these are the stats for, for EIAs between 2015 and 2019. There are roughly 1,200 EIA applications per year in South Africa. And it's up to us as NGOs and, and the, the broader community to respond to these as interested and affected parties to guide whether they should happen or not. And it's just not possible. So it's really important that we go through a process of identifying which of these we should tackle. So similarly to the previous map that EWT developed, we've developed a 20% map, which covers 20% of the land surface area, which is the really important areas that we will focus on in responding to development applications. So these are the areas that we will definitely respond to if there is a development application. And that's based on the water production and the biodiversity values of these areas. So if there's a development application in one of these areas, we will be in there and we will be in for the fight. So we're getting to the end of the talk. Um, what I'd like to do is just celebrate some of the amazing work that has been done, some of the protected areas that we have proclaimed so far. And to do that, I'm going to run through a slideshow. This first one is the Elansburg Nature Reserve in the Amatola Mountains. This area protects a large proportion of the global population of the Amatola toad, which up until 10 years ago was thought to be extinct. Um, and this work is being driven by our very own Dr. Jean Torrent, who a couple of months ago received a Whitley Award, which for those of you that don't know is like a green Oscar. It's really a fantastic award. So thank you, Jean, for all the work that you're doing. Then we've got Bradley. Bradley Gibbons is really in charge of all of the strategic water source areas up in the Highland grasslands. Eastern Free State, Western KZN, and Southern Pumalanga. Essentially, the water for Johannesburg and Durban, the water supply, fresh water supply into the future for both of those metropolises is on this guy's shoulders. And he just needs massive credit for the work that he's doing. So keep at it, Brad. Pitkopa Nature Reserve is in Central Free State. This is a fantastic piece of land with sun gazers and all kinds of things. You can just see how beautiful it is. Another one of Bradley's sites. Then the, the Eastern Escarpment running along the border of KZN and Free State. Again, Bradley's work. This is funded by Whitley as well. And I mean, you can see these landscapes. They're absolutely beautiful. And these, these are the areas that provide all that water. Then there's Sulflay Nature Reserve. This is in process of being proclaimed in the Western Cape. Quibus is the guy getting his head chopped off by his colleague there. Um, Quibus is driving quite a lot of protected area expansion work. He, he started off working with a crane program in Southern KZN, and now he manages our drylands conservation program, and he's driving protected area pro proclamations through the Northern Cape and Western Cape, and now into the Eastern Cape as well. There's also the proposed Pupkales Fontaen Protected Environment, another one of Quibus's sites. Then the proposed Lettuce Crawl Nature Reserve. This is it, deep in the heart of the Karoo. Absolutely beautiful landscape. 
and then proposed the proposed Honeybush Nature Reserve. And Purvis is a very lucky man because this this is actually his own property. He lives on this property for half of his life, so it's an, it's a really stunning piece of landscape. And then this is a, a a site also under the threatened amphibian program, and it's a Pickersgill reed frog site. And this is a community um, nature reserve. So Sharice has done some really amazing work working with this community to get the, this proclamation through. And then, of course, all of our, our various sites, I'm not going to go through all of them. There, there are a whole lot of sites in the southern Drakensberg that support crane conservation. And Tanya Smith manages our crane conservation program. And she's really driving a lot of amazing work in, across the eastern part of the country, in fact. And then in Gauteng, most people think that Gauteng is all just built up. But this is a beautiful clip crawl protected environment. And this work is driven by Emily Taylor. Um, Emily has done incredible work in Gauteng. She co-founded the Gauteng Biodiversity Stewardship Program, and she has really been the, the heart and soul of all of this work. So congratulations, Emily. And finally, the Soetpansberg. The Soetpansberg is a relatively new project. Um, Kath Weiss and Ulrich von Skalkweg drive this work. They, they have taken a project from its infancy just a few years ago into what is now looking towards proclaiming a 30,000 hectare nature reserve on some of the most beautiful landscape you could possibly imagine. This is the most northerly mountain range in South Africa, just west of Kruger. And if you ever want to visit it, please go onto the EWT website. You can stay in, in our accommodation on the property. So please make a visit. We are going to be developing hiking trails and running trails and all kinds of things in the South Pansberg. So as a, as a parting message, let's just hope that in a hundred years time, we can have at least a fair portion of our country that it still looks like this. If we can do that, I think we'll be okay. Thank you very much. I must acknowledge some of our, our donors. The, the, the main, the big donors that have supported a lot of this protected area expansion work are the Green Trust, the, Whit the Whitley Fund for Nature, and Rand Merchant Bank. And Rainforest Trust supports all of our EIA and screening tool work. So thank you very much to our donors. We cannot do any of this without you. So we're now on to the point where I can take some questions from you guys if you have any. Um, I did manage to get through that a little bit faster than I thought I did speak relatively quickly because I had a lot to get through. So apologies for that. Um, I can let you see my, my mug again. So let me see if I can see any questions here. We do have a few. So one of the questions here is who makes the decision about development where an endangered species would be threatened? So that's a, that's a complicated one. So what happens is that now, anyway, the, the screening tool provides the, the basis for identifying that there is a threatened species on the proposed development site. It then goes into a, a process of decision making. And ultimately, the competent authority, which is a provincial official, makes that decision. But that can be appealed and it can go all the way through to the, the high court. So, Ideally, what we want to get in place is that the competent authorities are sufficiently capacitated to realize the long-term impacts on a threatened species if a development is proposed that will have a significant impact there. So that's what we're working towards. In many instances, that's not the case. And if there's just one species that's just going to lose a bit of habitat, it gets overlooked. And that's what we're trying to fix. So to answer your question, it's the competent authority. And the competent authority in most instances is a is a provincial official. Um, let's see a couple of the other questions here. Why is it is nothing ever built into these kinds of strategies and projections to address curbing population explosion? That's from Mel Trip. So that, <laughs> that's a it's a very sensitive question, but a very sensible one. Um, whenever we do any strategic assessment in terms of trying to identify the root causes of any conservation issue. The root cause is always either political decision making or population pressure. So you hit the nail on the head. And the problem is how to address it. Do conservation organizations take this on? 
I don't know. The EWT does have a focus on this through a, a very detailed process um, that I'm not going to go into now, but I, I take your point and it is something that we have to consider and it's something that we do consider. So yes, we, we should be voicing that opinion more. It's about how to do it and how to empower women to make their own decisions about, about reproduction. So it's, all, it's more about re reproductive health than lobbying government. It's about what happens on the ground with people being able to make those decisions. Okay, there is some impetus again, sorry, let me try that again. There is some impetus again in large scale planting of speck worm in the Eastern Cape. This may save planting pine trees. Yes, so not so much a question, more of a statement. Yes, speck worm has been shown to be a very good carbon, very good at sequestering carbon. So in the thicket biome, that is definitely being pushed as a rehabilitation process. So yes, thank you, Alistair Stalker. That's a very good point. Um, okay, let me tackle one of these long questions. Here's one from Michelle Watson. How do you address the issue of the EIA being paid for by the developer? Ah, that's a, that's a challenging question. I once led a protest against the development and the company doing the EIA made it clear they were there to keep their client happy and they would try to push the development through to keep themselves in business. 100%. And this is actually what got me into EIAs because I, I saw one or two examples of it's certainly not the case with all EAPs, as we call them, environmental assessment practitioners. The vast majority of environmental assessment practitioners are incredibly responsible and trying to make the right environmental decisions. But every now and then you get a practitioner that ruins that, um, the black sheep, if you will. So it's, it's a difficult thing to do. I, we, we, we can't do much about it in terms of changing the flow of money because there are just too many options or opportunities for um, money laundering and just other kinds of wangling to get in there. So it's a difficult one. What we're trying to do rather than, than tackle this, because if we get all the other processes right, this won't be an option anymore. We're trying to make sure that the system is robust enough that the EAP isn't capable of just supporting the developer anymore. If the system is strong enough, then there will be sufficient evidence that can't be overlooked and we can get the right decisions made. From Eleanor Mary Cadel, surely the conservation philosophies and practical solutions that we generate in South Africa can influence global thinking. 100% Eleanor, you are you dead right. And in many instances it does. South Africa is at the forefront of a lot of conservation processes and we do contribute to a lot of international thinking and a lot of international work. So that's absolutely true. And then one final question here, I think from Natalie Ace, could you please elaborate? Is there, is there are any EWT priority areas in the Northern Cape? Yes, absolutely there are. And I would urge you to speak to Quibus Teron who manages our drylands program. Um, Quibus, is very passionate in the Northern Cape. He does a lot of work and there are a lot of priority areas. So I, I don't have a map that I can show you now, but we could certainly speak about that. There are priority areas up in the North um, and a lot of others down through the South, through the Oerdlofskloof um, area near Nivoetville and obviously our river run rabbit population areas um, in the central and eastern areas are also absolute priorities, but there are vast number of priorities in, in, the, in the Northern Cape, so it certainly hasn't been left. So I think if we can leave it there, thank you very much for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, you guys are the conservation supporters of the world, so please keep supporting conservation and keep doing what you do. Thank you. <laughs>